Well, good to see you guys again this morning. I was, Gail and I were out of town last week. Um, we've spent a year and a half in the book of Acts, and um, thank you for your endurance. We, we, we begin a, a kind of the opposite kind of a series today uh, for the next season. I'm taking just one classic Old Testament passage at a time. So you can't get bored with these passages. I'm just doing them one, one time. Hopefully you won't get bored. Maybe you will. Um, but, but I'm excited about this. I'm choosing some of the great passages in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, also, let me just echo what Michael Sanson, one of our lead pastors, said uh, earlier. It's just that uh, God has so much for us when we find our place of ministry. And just encourage you, don't to overthink that. Pray and seek the Lord, but then just jump in and get started somewhere. Uh, you get started in ministry somewhere, your ministry is going to find you. Um, fourthly, thirdly, the, the, the way to be, get started being a part of the Woods Edge family is through our community groups. We've got a connect room. For more information, if you're at the pavilion, we've got an information table. If you're online, we've got a uh, place to go. Moses has died. The nation is about to enter the promised land, and Moses, that giant of a leader, of a biblical hero, has died. Moses, the man that God chose to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt. Moses, the man that God chose to speak through, speak to through the burning bush. Moses, the man through whom God did these ten incredible plagues in Egypt. Moses, the man through whom God splits the, right, the Red Sea wide open. Moses, the man who receives from the finger of God the Ten Commandments. The man who God met with face to face has died just at the time when the people of Israel are entering that long promised land where they had been heading for 40 years and been promised for 400 years. So the baton is passing from Moses to Joshua at this critical moment. Who would be adequate to take the place of Moses? Who would be adequate to lead two and a half million people into the promised land and conquer all those nations and keep the people close to God's heart? Who would be adequate for that? Not surprisingly, Joshua felt fearful, uh, overwhelmed, alone, um, intimidated. And in Joshua chapter 1, God comes to Joshua and speaks to him and says basically this, Joshua, I know You are fearful and intimidated, but I will be with you. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And Joshua, I will give to you a book. This will be a book like no other book. And this book will guide you as you lead my people. Church, this morning, we're not unlike that. We face challenges, and at times, you and I feel intimidated, uh, alone, discouraged, and maybe at times overwhelmed. I certainly have a number of times in my life. And God comes to us in the challenges of life, like this morning. Whether or not those challenges involve work or home, family or marriage, finances, COVID, uh, whatever it is, and God says to you and me, I will be with you always. And I have given you a book And this book is like no other book. And live by this book. So this morning, we're going to focus on only one verse in Joshua 1, verse 8. Nearly 50 years ago, I was at Rice University as a freshman. I just had come to Christ that summer. And uh, someone uh, who was discipling me had me memorize Joshua 1, 8. I think it was my freshman year. And for 50 years since... Uh, 1972, 73, my freshman year, this verse has been lodged in my heart and in my brain. And it has been life-giving for me. So we're going to focus on Joshua 1.8, but I want us to read it in context in Joshua 1. So if you'll stand with me in honor of God's Word. I'm reading from Joshua 1. If you've got a Bible with you, open it up. If you don't, uh, not to worry. We've got it on the screens. Here it is. Here's the context. 
After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore rise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. You think he was afraid? Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you, Wood's Edge, wherever you go. This is God's holy word. Please be seated. There are five components to this monumental verse, five elements to it. The first component tells us what we're dealing with here, this book of the law. Now, God is referring specifically to the book of the law that he just gave Moses. I'm reading through the book of Deuteronomy and my daily devotions, uh, not for preaching, just for my soul, and uh, that this is the specific book. But by implication and by extension, the, the Torah, the, the, the teaching of God is the first five books of the law that, that God gave Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Of course, by the time Jesus got here, the, the, his Bible was the entire Old Testament, and our version of it, beginning with Genesis, ending with Malachi, their Old Testament ended with Second Chronicles, different order. So uh, for us, of course, it is the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, as Paul writes in his very last letter in 2 Timothy, all Scripture is, is, is breathed out by God, God inspired, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteous, righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. So for us, what are we talking about? This book of the law, this book of God's Torah teaching, it's the Bible, it's the Word of God. And God is... Uh, saying, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Okay, the second component, we see the next phrases. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. God is telling Joshua, and you, and me, the people of God, to meditate on Scripture. What does it mean to meditate on the Scripture? It means to read it, to ponder it, to think it, study it, memorize it, reflect on it, chew on it, reflect upon it, treasure it. Think about think of it this way. Think about a dog chewing on a bone. Got the picture? I mean, that dog is chewing on that bone, and he is having a big time. And he just could chew on it a couple of hours. That, that's what it means to meditate. Chew on that book like a dog chews on a bone. Worry on that like a dog worries with a bone. Um, just delight in it. Chew on it over and over. In fact, the literal translation of the word rendered meditate there is the word growl. It could be used for growl, an animal growling. It's not the growl of a dog uh, to scare you off. It, it is the, the growl of a dog chewing on a bone and it's the soft growl, like a cat purring, and he's having such a good time. Ooh, mm, so good. Mm, this is great. Mm. Uh, that kind of growl, that kind of meditate. We're growling on Scripture. We're delighting in Scripture. We're meditating on Scripture. The idea 
includes speaking Scripture aloud. That's why he starts off, before he gets to the verb meditate, do, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. So, so it involves kind of a, 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 a low muttering voice. It may, may be louder, but, but you're, you're, you're not just reading Scripture silently, uh, passively, but, but you're kind of speaking it to you aloud. You know, if, if you remember from English classes uh, growing up that you read poetry aloud, and uh, you don't have to always read the Bible aloud, but, but it's a helpful thing that when you are speaking it out loud, you, you get, you know, you can hear it as well as speak it. And, uh, and, and it's just the idea you're going over and over it. You're meditating. It. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. So it, it's not calling us to race through the Bible as quickly as possible so much as to as to let the Bible just chew on it and delight in it. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. Now, we think, wouldn't we, that God would say, do not let this book of the law depart from your ears, or maybe your brain, or better even yet, your heart. But isn't it interesting that God says, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth? Because that's kind of how the Hebrews would meditate, and it's a good practice. When you, when you talk out loud... You know, maybe you're by yourself, but you're just kind of over and over. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. And you're just kind of going over it and over it. Implication of memorizing it. Chew on Scripture like a dog chews on a bone. Okay, third component, he tells you just when to do this. Uh, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. I, I, I know that God is not telling me that that's 24-7. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the principles of Bible study is if you are, have taken an overly literal, wooden approach to it, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to miss the point sometimes. God's not an over-literalist. If I say to you, it's raining cats and dogs, you know they're not cats and dogs falling from the sky. It's an idiom. The Bible uses idiom. It doesn't mean every second. You can sleep, you can eat, you can talk to friends, but... It's strong language, isn't it? Throughout the day, continually, all the time. This book of the law shall not depart. Almost like it's your cell phone. <laughs> now, he states it negatively when he says, shall not depart from your mouth. Shall not depart from your mouth. <laughs> and then he states it positively when he says, night and day. Meditate on it night and day. So he's really emphasizing it. Um, he means this, this, the Word of God should be on our hearts and minds throughout the day. That, that the Word of God should govern all that I do and all that I think and all that I feel and every nook and cranny of life. Let this be your north star to guide you. So far we've had three components, three out of the five. First one tells us what we're dealing with, the Word of God. Secondly... Tells us what to do with the Word of God. Meditate on it. The third one tells us when to meditate on it. All the time. All the day. Continue. Fourth component. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Fourth component is not knowing the Bible, but obeying the Bible. Point is not knowledge, but obedience. Now, so many Christians stumble right here. At times, all of us do. We think that if we uh, read the Bible, that, you know, we get a little spiritual check mark or something. Or, or if we come to a Bible-believing church and hear a sermon, that's it. You're good. Uh, the point is not to know the Bible or hear the Bible, but to do the Bible, obey the Bible. It, the, the analogy that I use, not original, is, is I'm playing tennis with somebody. Somebody's on the other court. They hit, hit, the, hit the ball into my court, and, and I've got a responsibility to do something, don't I? I can't just be passive. I've got the responsibility. I better respond. Okay, God, every time you're exposed to the Word of God, God has hit the ball to your court. ball is in your court. The, the, the ball is in your court right now. How are you going to respond to it? Every time we're exposed to the Word of God. Somebody put it this way, said, when all is said and done, more is said than done. <laughs> God's not so much looking for hearers of the Bible, but doers of the Bible. The point is not information, but transformation. 
The point is not how many times you've gone through the Bible, but how many times the Bible has gone through you. Church, at Wood's Edge, I, I think to some extent because um, my natural personality could, could be a little bit um, knowledge-based, uh, cerebral, something like that. Uh, I, I could kind of get focused on the knowledge. And, and because God has, has put this value so deeply in my, my heart that I, I just continually bring that to you guys, point here at Wood's Edge, measure maturity is not how much of the Bible we know, how much of it we do. It's obedience. It's literally loving God. Okay. Fifth component. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then... You will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The way I learned it in the American Standard, and then you will have success. Fifth component is the grand promise. If we meditate on Scripture and obey it, then God's going to do something incredible. He will put His hand of favor and blessing upon our life, in an unusual way, the God of the universe will bless us and prosper us. Clearly, it is not talking about financial success or financial prospering. He's talking about something much bigger than that, much more important than that. He's talking about prospering in all of life, success in all of life. He's talking about God's favor and, 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 and hand of blessing that it would give you wisdom in relationships, in family, in, in friendship, at in work, and at play, and, and uh, in the future, and uh, in marriage, and in parenting, and in every area. It means that, that, that the God of the universe will, will pour out upon you the fruit of the Spirit, that you will have more and more as you obey the, the Bible, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that his, he will give you those things, and he will pour them out. We want um, uh, kind of uh, go out and achieve those things or grab those things ourselves, but, but we will seek the Lord, and he will give those to us. It means that you will experience down deep the kind of, kind of life you, you deeply long for. I mean, we all long for a certain kind of a life that has joy and peace and, and, and loving relationships and, and and, and trust in our God, and we long for that. This is the way. This is the way. God is saying to you and me this morning, Wood's Edge, here is my promise to you. If you will meditate on this book continually and obey it, because to obey the book, Bible is to obey me, if you will do these things, then I will make your life, I will bless your life in a way you cannot imagine. Church, think with me about this. Most parents... In this area, and in most of affluent U.S. suburban America, what's the measure of success for their kids? This is it. It's on steroids around here. Uh, but, but you want your child, we want our children to succeed academically, if they're in sports, athletically. Uh, activities, be popular, have, you know, but especially succeed academically. So that they can go get good grades, hopefully straight A's, and, and that they could go to a good college and get a great job. That is the unspoken and at times spoken measure of success for parents for every child. God says they've got it all wrong. They completely miss it. I'm not against education. I've I got a lot of education. I'm for education. But that's not going to give my kids success in life nor yours. But this is what God says. Teach your children to love this book and to obey it. And that is going to be the key to success. How can you encourage your children to love this book and to obey it? This is how. It's pretty simple. You love this book and obey it. You treasure it. You don't control them, but the single best thing you can do is that you yourself would set the example. You would love it. 
you would treasure it. You would obey it. Live with people who live like this. Go to a church with people who live like this. Be in a community group with people who live like this. Encourage one another to live this way. Get in a church where they prioritize Scripture, not knowing it, but, but, but living it. Not just topics about the Bible, but uh, the, the actual words of Scripture. Not, not, not just kind of lightly based on Scripture, but rooted in Scripture. By the way, just as soon as the high risk of COVID begins to lift for you, get yourself and your family back with God's people, treasuring God's Word, because that's one of the things that God calls us to obey. And, and so your children can see with their own eyes and taste and feel of people, what it means to treasure this book and seek God. What is God saying to you and me this morning? He's saying, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Let me ask you a question, actually three questions. Well, first of all, why don't Christians read the Bible more? I know a lot of you are, are lovers of scripture, but, but why don't Christians read the Bible more? Well, uh, I, I'll give you three reasons. One is many Christians don't know how to read the Bible. You know, th this Bible is not an easy book. It, it, it at times can be quite hard to understand and confusing, and besides, it's a massive book. However, it is a lie of Satan that you cannot understand the Bible. You can God will speak to you through Scripture. You may not understand everything, but you will understand the main things. We want to help you understand it as well as possible. We've got an excellent resource here. We've got our Woods Edge Institute led by Phil Kwan. We've got Bible study methods. I think Tim Johnson is currently teaching. It's outstanding. It's offered year-round online at any time. And then every spring and fall, it's, lot, it's offered in person. You can go to our website and sign up. But... First reason, so many Christians don't read the Bible is because they don't know how to read the Bible, and are they let Satan convince them that they can't understand the Bible? It's a lie. Secondly, second reason that some Christians don't read the Bible is because they don't have time. Reading the Bible is priority 22 out of 27, and they just don't get to it very often. However, if we understood the treasure that this book is, no one could keep us from this book. We would neglect other things. Screen time, hobby time, online shopping time, whatever it is. We, we would neglect other things, but we would not neglect this. We coddle ourselves when we say, I don't have time. It's better to be honest and say, I choose not to make time for that. Third reason. Third reason why some people don't prioritize Scripture is because it doesn't seem relevant. It doesn't seem as relevant to our daily lives as the things we read, such as a text from a friend or a post on Twitter. Now, most people I know prioritize social media posts from friends or even acquaintances or even strangers or even enemies more than they prioritize the very words of the eternal, holy, sovereign God of the universe who loves me. That, did, did you hear what I said? Try, try to fathom that. Try, try to process that because it might be true of you. Most people that I know of in the world put more priority on hearing the words of a friend or an acquaintance or a stranger or even an enemy more than they prioritize the very words of God knock me over. No one that I know of who reads this Bible very much at all would ever say it's not relevant. It is not only the most timely book in the world, it is the most timeless book in the world. I've been reading it every day for 50 years. 48, 49 years, and, and it's not getting less relevant, it's getting more relevant. It's not getting more boring, it's getting more exciting to me. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make the way prosperous, 
and then you'll have success. This book is as relevant to people's lives as oxygen is to fire, as water is to thirst. Okay, let me, let me take the corollary question or the complementary question. That, that question was, why don't Christians read the Bible? Here, let me take it this way. Why read the Bible? Three reasons, quickly. One, read the Bible to know truth. Church, we live in a day where there is so much spiritual illiteracy and abnormality, so much uh, delusion, confusion, deception. We got a spiritual enemy prowling around wanting to devour our families. And we need to know truth. We need to know truth. Secondly, read the Bible, not only to know truth, but to know how to live. This Bible is not an information book. It is an is a op operating instructions book. It's a manual for how to live life book. It's a, 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 a manual to show us what to do when we're in the midst of a cosmic spiritual battle. And, and, and it's a real battle, and the stakes are heaven and hell. And, and if we understood it that way, nobody could keep us from this book. Read the Bible to know truth, read the Bible to, to know how to live. Thirdly, most importantly, read the Bible to know God. This is a basic reason. Our, pur our purpose is not so much to learn theology, but to know God. We want to go beyond the page to the person. We don't, we don't so much read the Bible as we pray the Bible. We're just talking with God as we're in the Bible. Okay, I'm going to have a dialogue. Three suggestions, four suggestions to get started. By the way, I, I've written a small book, Unhurried Time with God, that talks about this more at length in the cafes. One, get a plan. Are you going to begin, uh, if, if, you, if you're not doing this now you, and you begin tomorrow morning, are you going to begin in the book of Genesis and read a chapter a day? Or are you going to read you know, Genesis 1 and Matthew 1 and kind of go through it that way? Or... Um, so, some might do the one-year Bible or the chronological Bible or something else. What I do is uh, every day I'm about a half hour in the Old Testament, a half hour in the New Testament, however far I get. But get a plan. Just get a plan. Secondly, set a time. Set a time. You're going to do this the first thing in the morning. You're going to do it after breakfast. You're going to do it, you know, when you get the kids off to school. You're going to get, it, uh, you're going to, get to it after the kids go, go to sleep at night or while your toddler is taking a nap or while you're commuting uh, to uh, downtown Houston, hopefully you do it audio by, by then, or uh, <laughs> s set a time, even if at times it, it varies, you've got an appointment with God every day. Thirdly, find a place. It might be your big recliner in your living room, it might be your uh, bed, it might be your couch, it might be walking on the streets in your neighborhood. For me, it's walking the hallways of our, of our staff building uh, in the early morning hours before anybody gets there, find a place, a default place. Fourthly, it's an important one. Many of you might resist this one. Get accountability and encouragement. This is the way God designed you. This is why Weight Watchers works. Have somebody check on you. You check on them. You know, there are a number of folks at Wood's Edge that every morning, they, they read Scripture, ha jot a few notes about it, and they send it to a group of people, a small group of people. Or some friends. And they've just got that sort of accountability and encouragement. And uh, this is the way God wired us. Um, maybe you do that in your community group. Maybe with a close friend. But get some kind of encouragement and accountability. Let me paraphrase what God is saying to you and to me this morning in Joshua 1.8. He's saying, Bob, or Susan, whatever your name is. Insert your name here. Tim, Tamara. Tim, I have given you a book like no other book. Treasure this book. Read this book. Study this book. Follow this book. Fill your heart and mind with this book so that you think about it throughout the day. And above all, Bob, Susan, above all, obey this book. I'm not looking for hearers of the Bible, but for doers. Dear child, if you will do this, no matter, no matter what else happens in your life, you will know success in life. I will put my hand of favor and blessing upon you. And at the end of your life, you will have known success. 
Let me close this morning with the strong words of John Wesley, one of the great men that God's used in history. John Wesley was, and I know that you have heard this before, but I need to hear it again. He's talking to his followers. He started inadvertently the Methodist church. He didn't know he'd started it, but he did. And uh, he's talking to them about daily time with God, and he called it private exercises, was his phrase. This is what he said to his people, and this is what I say to you. He says, oh, begin. Fix some part of every day for private exercises. Whether you like it or not, read and pray daily. It is for your life. There is no other way, else you will be a trifler all your days. It is for your life. There is no other way. Uh, fix some part every day, whether you like it or not, else you will be all your days just a dilettante, an amateur. Uh, um, just somebody who doesn't ever dive in the water but sticks their toe in the water. You're just messing around. Or else you will be a trifler with God all your days. May it not be that the people of Wood's Edge were messing around with God all our days. Stand with me, please. Lord, thank you for this book. In the darkest times of my life, Lord God, it has been a rock to stand on and a foundation to live my life upon. Where would I be, Lord God, without the gift of this book from you? Oh, God, may the people of Wood's Edge, may the people who are here this morning not live and die and miss out on the essential resource of life. May it not be. May it not be. May we fling away our cell phones before that happens. And may we treasure and obey your holy word. Bless these people, Lord God, who love you so. Bless them, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.